video games, comics, magic cards, it's who I am. And there were times where I was made fun of, or I was a nerd. You know, the nerds are winning now. I'm Nelson Laffey, and this is Consigner Confidential. I grew up in Saratoga, New York, and I was raised by my grandparents and my mom, and I had just a great upbringing, had some great friends along the way. It was definitely a lot of fun. Really early on, I was the first kid on the block to have it. You know, everyone was at my house. My, my grandparents would make the peanut butter and jellies for everybody. And I, I'll be honest, I was in the, the classes for special needs. I was not a good student. And when I went to play these video games, it was an area of my life where I could be great at something. Specifically games like Final Fantasy, RPGs like you know, Dragon Warrior, uh, the Shadow Gates of the World, the Deja Vus, and then obviously into Zelda. You know, Zelda being that particular franchise for me that you know, I resonated with, you know, it brought that fantasy kind of mindset to the, to the overall screen for me. For me, video games was always that cornerstone where it started everything. And then from there, I realized like, I really enjoy the fantasy realm of just overall hobbies in general. And in 97, Magic the Gathering came out. It helped with my reading, it helped with my math skills, it helped my interpersonal talking relationship skills. It was everything that I didn't, I needed that didn't realize it at the time. My grandfather was a big Jim Rummy player and card player and he loved it. He would play all the time. Um, he would play with me, he would cheat every single time. And he never was big on video games. He, he knew how important they were to me, but what he was big on was, was sports. And I still tried to play sports for him, you know? And it was important to me because, you know, I wanted to be that for him, but he knew how important video games were for me, you know? And it was a time where we shared for a long time and he knew what I was collecting. He'd take me to the trade card stores and everything and just really kind of, support my, my passion, you know, until his passing. Like he would always ask me, how's the games going? He had no idea of the store we're building. He had no idea of what we we're taking on, but it's an emotional time for me because, you know, he's why I'm here, you know, where I'm at, so. At the age of 18, I graduated high school um, and I definitely wasn't the valedictorian of this class, right? So if I didn't go to the Marines and went to college, I was gonna waste my grandparents' money. I knew it, I wasn't mature enough. I needed something to change my life, so off I went for four years. Uh, I did tours in Iraq. When I got back, everything that I had from the collectible side was never touched. It hadn't moved. My grandparents kept everything right where it was. It had gone up in value. I mean, it was, I went from making $500 a week in the Marine Corps, or every two weeks in the Marine Corps, uh, to having a, a sizable net worth just on what they've held for four years. I got very lucky in that sense that I kind of struck some gold there. Came back, used that capital to further push the hobby and kind of had a little bankroll, if you will, of collectible money. Uh, and then started building my network of folks, you know, that I trusted, and it's helped me a ton. And the Marine Corps is a big part of that. I had an ability now where I've always been in a worse situation, right? And so I've took that to my businesses and I've taken that into my personal life where I've always been in worse, right? And it's definitely helped me a lot. So in 2008, I was in a card store. I had an individual by the name of Greg Parker who was coming back from Princeton University. Greg had mentioned to me about wanting to start a store, wanted to have me support it and help him and travel with him and kind of build this thing out. Greg said, hey man, do, you, do me a favor, open up a bank account uh, and tell you how much we need and I'm gonna make it happen. And I'm like, yeah, right, man. Like, this isn't gonna happen, like no shot. Like, all right, but what do I got to lose? I'm like, okay, I opened it. It's a, you know, it's a citizen's bank account in downtown Boston. Here's the number, right? Nothing to lose. I'm in here giving out my social security card. I've known Greg about six months. The next day, there's $100,000 in our account. I had never even seen anything close to that. So I'm freaked out. I tell my wife, like, this is where we are. Like, what are we supposed to do? And Greg's like, all right, let's get going. And it, we, we had a journey and still do now to this day, 14 years later, where, you know, we, we have made it into something special. We started out as an online-based store. Um, what that meant was we were basically gonna be an eBay store. We were gonna go to the shows, buy at the shows, and put it on eBay. That was our idea. But over time, people just kept coming into our store in Clifton Park, New York and we would sell in the store. And so finally Greg bought one display case and people would come in and shop the display case. And then he bought a second one and a third one. And then we got a Hasbro account. And then we got a Pokemon and Nintendo account. And then we had a Torments in the back. Uh, and we've taken that store now to where we have events weekly and we have a vast variety of products and it's a very successful uh, and lucrative store. And now built a warehouse. Um, where we are one of the largest Warhammer distributors in the country, if not the world, as well as one of the bigger Magic the Gathering and Pokemon distributors on the Northeast of the United States. It's pretty cool to look back and see it all started with a $100,000 deposit on a whim from a friend. This, this business is very personal because 
I remember walking in as a kid to the store with $20 from my grandfather. They'd drop me off for a couple hours at a mall and say, hey, you know, go to the local sci-fi shop or the video game store and kind of hang out. Um, and I wanted to recreate that in our business. And, you know, when I go to the stores now, you see that. You see the, the parents there with their kids or, you know, the young kid come and asking the questions or asking the same question 20 times and knowing that was you long ago. And you see the hobby is in a great place, that it's still there, that the kids are still seeing that, that excitement that we had 20 years ago and, or 30 years ago. And for me, you know, that's the driving force. So amongst all of the businesses and the things that I've done, I've had a supported uh, wife uh, for 10 years now that has allowed for this to happen. Um, you have no one, I have, no one has any idea how many struggles and things that she's provided to get through for me to be able to do what I do. You know, watching our son on weekends every single day, you know, making sure that I have everything I need, packing my luggage to go to these shows and making sure I don't forget anything, you know, clearing the path for me to be successful, you know, and being in that background for us. And, you know, she's the true champion of this. You know, it really is emotional. Sorry. You know, when we started out married, I think I had like 500 bucks. And it was crazy because, you know, she went to Harvard University and she's dating a guy that went to Target, worked at a Target store. And we had some tough times. We never had a car. We would push a cart to the supermarket <laughs> and fill it up with things and go home. And she believed in me when I was on these grinds and I'd make a bad mistake in collectibles and I'd go upside down or backwards. And, you know, she was always there. And it was a scenario where we just had to have people believe in me. And I don't think I could have, been, I would not have been here without her. Two years in uh, to us being married, we had Mason. And Mason is my son. Mason is now nine. At the age of two, uh, Mason was diagnosed with autism. Nothing changed for me specifically other than knowing that, you know, I'm gonna be taking care of him for the rest of my life. And that responsibility goes beyond the age of 18. And for me, the levels and the intensities then also went way up. So I started doing some projects. You know, one of the big projects that I use is the Mason Project. In partnership with Frank Adams Jewelers, um, is myself and my wife, we investing in Rolex watches, usually two to three a year, and we put them away for him. Then um, at the age of 65, um, they'll be going up for auction um, as a group, and that will go into Mason's trust. Um, Mason is an incredible child. You know, for me, he is my utmost motivation. He's why I do this. That's not. Lip service, that is everything and everything to me. I don't do this for anyone else anymore. And it's interesting because in your hobbies, you're trained to kind of be selfish, right? <laughs> you're a selfish person in the hobby business, right? Because it's your collection, my collection. You never hear it's ours or theirs or us. It's always, this is mine, I am, I am proud of, or I, I, I. This has truly become his collection. I manage it, you know? And so I'm the caretaker to it and it's very personal now. And I think everything happens for a reason. You know, and I'm a good, I mean, the Marine Corps kind of prepared me for it, I guess, because, you know, I know why Mason came to me, you know, and why he came to my wife. You know, we're the right people for this. So I wake up every day, right, and I think of what purposes I want to wake up to. I'm thinking about, like, all right, what do I want to chase in the hobbies? What do I want to go for? When I see my son Mason, who is trying to put his shirt on every morning, he's trying to tie his shoes, he's trying to, you know, speak, you know, speak some words to me, he's trying to communicate. I know how hard he's working upstairs in that mind, how hard he's putting in. And I can't with a good conscience then just be like, I'm gonna mail it in, right? I'm not gonna lose. I'm not gonna allow myself to lose. And if I do, I'm up real quick and coming right back at it. So he is the only motivation in my life. I take him on the road with me where I can and expose him to people. I don't, you know, ever hold that in and say, well, we're not gonna do this for that. I want him to, to experience what I experienced on, on his level and where he wants to be. And so that's what we do, and it's a lot of fun. I can promise everybody that I had never thought of collecting a video game. Um, when I started out, I ripped them open before they even got to the KB Toy Store. I was in the car reading the manual, uh, threw the box out right when I got home, put it right into the NES and just ripped it for seven, 10, 12 hours straight, and then back-to-back -back weekends until either I beat it or I had literally you know, calluses on my thumbs from playing so much off the games. You know, the, the collection that I, that I built with video games um, being sealed now is really a snapshot of my childhood. Um, specifically, the role-playing games, the Final Fantasies, the Double Dragons, the Deja Vus. There's a third print Zelda in here that I'm excited for people to kind of take a look at and evaluate for pricing. And it is arguably my favorite piece in my collection. 
and it's arguably going to be, if not, is the most coveted piece throughout the entire lot. I don't think I've ever met somebody that says, I don't like Zelda, right? Um, it's a franchise that kind of um, has stand to the test of time, and it's a, t it's a title that I'm very excited for whoever owns it to, you know, to take care of it. And then versus games, the Street Fighters, you know, the Marvel Capcom 90 plus plus, highest graded in the world. It's a versus game that I played in the arcade as a kid. Um, for me, it's probably the one game that when I gave it to Golden, I almost took it back. I wanted, to, I didn't want to hand it over. And and Jared and the team, they they're very convincing and very good at what they do, and I trust them a ton. But that was one that I didn't want to let go of. There's a lot of things in this lot that I knew. Um, would get people excited. There's a Contra sealed in here. There's Battletoads, the you know the hardest game in the world to ever beat. Getting to you know share them and sell them on the on the platform with Golden is something I'm excited about um, for for several reasons. Number one, um, you know a lot of my friends wanted to own these games now, and they're going to get hopefully get the chance to do that. But at the same time, like I'm just excited to see the reception. You know, both from you know friends and professionals in the, in, in the business to kind of see what these guys think of how I built this lot for for us and and go from there. I look at right now where the markets are overall for collectibles, and I'm really thrilled that it's being recognized for where it is. You know, it's a, it's become an investment class. You're starting to see the consolidation of some of these grading companies and services being looked into by, you know, mainstream marketing and Wall Street and whatnot, and, and taking them into a whole nother level. And for me, it, it just reinforces the fact that I, that I was on the right track you know, throughout my entire collectibles career, that I knew what I was doing was true and passionate. And there were times where, especially in the Magic years, where I was made fun of for playing Magic, or I was a nerd. And, you know, the nerds are winning now. <laughs>